Right. Well, I'll meet more people if they come in, but I'll get started. So it's a Friday afternoon and I'm sure people want to, you know, eventually, eventually get to sleep or family or whatever. Right. Okay, can everyone see this? Okay, perfect. Love that. It's beautiful. Um, so yeah, let me make sure I'm recording. Yes. Perfect. I'm recording. Okay. So today we're going to learn about water resources and economic theory and how to use um, economics and water protection in the context of debate. Um, so I'm Victoria. Nope, I clicked too hard. Um, so perfect. Um, first is about me. So I have um, a degree in economics from UGA an emphasis in public policy, which we'll get to why that's important in a moment. And I taught and TA'd a principles of microeconomics course in the Terry College of Business while I was in school. And I worked as an economics researcher at the University of Southern California, USC. Um, I have to make sure everything was okay. It is. Um, at the Center for Economic and Social Research. And then I want to pull some of you all and kind of see if we have any additional context um, for any of this kind of going to lecture. Um, I know in some states, economics is actually a part of the mandatory curriculum, like in the state of Georgia. Um, it is not in the state of Missouri where I grew up. Um, so I was wondering if anyone has taken any economics classes. And then even if you haven't, if anyone has heard of um, the terms um, private goods versus public goods, externalities, and then monopolies. I think I can see the chat if there's a chat. I don't know. But you can also unmute yourself if you if anyone knows or has heard of these terms and can say what they mean. I've heard of some of the terms, but we haven't taken in any economic classes. Good, good. Then this will be super helpful. If you've already taken, you know, a bunch of economics courses, it's not going to be as helpful because um, then you'll know those things. But yeah, click, keep excellent clicking on Zoom and moving my PowerPoint. Um, that's a whole thing. Um, so yes, wonderful. So we have some, some idea. So it's the objectives. What, what are we going to learn? Like, why, why is Victoria doing this lecture? Like, what, what is happening? Why is this useful? Um, so first is understanding the type of good water is. Um, what externalities are, and that leads into the problems facing the water infrastructure. We're going to ask who owns water, and we're going to talk about the solutions, um, and then talk about it in the context of debate um, and what that means. So whether you're running, um, you know, the economy day, like obviously that becomes obvious. But specifically, I know a lot of you all are really interested in the cap K, right? So can capitalism solve water problems? What are the limitations? How would it solve it? Why can't capitalism solve the water crisis are going to be some really important questions. But in order to be able to answer that, we need to understand the limits of economics. We need to understand the limits of free markets and what they can and can't do. Or otherwise, how do we know if the cap K can solve the case? How do we know the limits? How do we know how the alt um, interacts with the F if we're not able to answer those questions? So a lot of this will be a lot of theory, but then we'll really move into how do we um, utilize this in the context of debate. Um, so there's kind of three big picture economics like terms that we're going to be talking about. So the first is like types of goods. So it's going to be public goods, private goods, club common. You don't have to know what those are yet. We're going to dive deep into those. Um, and then second will be externalities, um, which is probably a word that at least we've maybe we've heard before, uh, maybe not in an economics contest, context, but we've maybe heard. Um, and then lastly, talking about, as far as economic terms at least, um, natural monopolies and how they're different from like an Amazon style monopoly um, that we've probably heard of. So there are four types of goods. Um, there's kind of two um, sort of axes, if you will, like an X and Y. 
Um, so the first question we ask is, is it rival or non-rival? And what that means is, is my using of it impacting your using of it? Um, and then the second question is, how excludable is it? Is it something that I can't exclude people from? Or is it something that um, I absolutely, like if someone buys it, that is the only person that can ever use it. Um, so there are four types of goods. There are private goods, common goods, club goods, and public goods. Yeah, that doesn't have to make sense yet. Now, here's some examples. This will really help. Um, so private goods are things, food, clothes, consumer food, basically anything you can buy at Target, probably a private good. Um, and then we have club goods. Um, so these are things that are excludable, but my usage doesn't impact your usage. Um, so like cable TV, the internet broadly, the fact that I'm on the internet in Missouri is not affecting you all being on the internet. Um, you know, Amazon Prime, if I have Amazon Prime, doesn't really affect your Amazon Prime usage. Um, you don't really care if I have it or not. I don't have it for like ethical reasons, but you know, you wouldn't care. Um, and then there's common goods. So um, things that are rival, like my um, usage impacts you, but there's really no way to exclude me. Um, so this is tragedy of the commons. Um, if you've heard that phrase before, that refers to common goods. That's why, why it's called that. Um, and so is there you know, public roads? Like I'm not excluded from them, but if there's a bunch of people on it, then it's going to impact you, um, like fishing. So if, um, keep clicking on Zoom, it's a whole problem. Um, so like fishing um, in like a lake, can't really be excluded, um, but my fishing impacts you. And then non-rival and non-excludable be public goods. So that's, you know, national defense. My getting national defense, um, you're hearing the sounds of rural Missouri if you're hearing that, sorry, um, doesn't affect, so my national defense doesn't affect your national defense. There's no way to exclude me from that. Um, or like clean air, my breathing in clean air, you, you can't exclude me from that, but it also doesn't impact you. Um, so that, of course, is water, which is really what we wanna know about. So the question is, what is water? There's no answer. Water is somehow all four of them because water acts very, very differently, which is a reason we have to understand all this theory behind it. It's not just simply like, you know, water is a public good, the end, done, okay, next. It's, it's not that, it, it becomes really complicated. And how we treat water really impacts the sort of policies that we're able to make or how we do and don't solve for these policies. Um, either in a critical sense or a policy sense, um, understanding how we are treating water is really important. So water can be and often acts like all four of these goods. So it's a private good in this case that the property rights, which we'll talk more about in a little bit of water, that if you have land and you have a lake on the land that it's rival and it's excludable. Um, but it's also able to act like a club good, right? Like when you have, you know, the city water, your water consumption really doesn't affect your neighbor. And whether or not you're taking a shower doesn't affect your neighbor, but it is excludable. Like your water can be turned off by the city. Um, and then we have common goods. So groundwater in a big aquifer um, underground is not excludable. Anyone on that land can go drill a well and access it, but it is rival that, especially if it's scarce. So if it's a scarce aquifer and there's not a lot of water in it, my taking the water does affect anyone else taking the water. Um, and it can also sometimes act like a public good um, because it's a ba it's considered you know, a basic human right. The clean water, I can't really exclude you from clean water if clean water is everywhere. And it's not rival, like my consumption of clean water, as long as it's not scarce and it's abundant, doesn't affect your um, access to it, right? So, so the concern of these four is how do we treat them? How do we you know, have policies around them? What happens, right? It's easy if it's a private good because then people should buy it. Like they should buy it like they buy t-shirts at Target, simple enough. If it's a public good, it should be provided by the, federal government, you know, like the Clean Water Act, like the military, 
things like that, that are provided by the federal government. Everyone thinks that's a basic good. Um, but then if it's a common good, then how do you buy it? You know, who controls it? You don't want to tragedy of the common situation, but it's a club good, and that might be the city accessing it, right? So it, we don't even know who is supposed to be in charge of it um, if we don't even know what type of good it is. But the problem is, it can be any of these four types of goods, right? So it, it can be any of these things. So figuring out what happens with water often sits in, is it scarce or not? Um, do we have plenty of water? If we have plenty of water, then it changes this rival versus non-rival discussion. If there's plenty of water, my access doesn't hurt your access. Um, and then it depends on whether or not we want it to be excludable. If there's plenty of water, we probably don't care if it's excludable or not, right? But if there's not a lot of water, then public then water moves from being a public good all of a sudden to a private good, and then it becomes treated differently. Um, and so that's some of the limitations and some of the kind of difficulty of even defining, you know, the economics of water is that water, depending on how scarce it is, can really act like any good possible. Um, but that's why that it's important to like understand this and why scarcity is so important to talk about um, in this context. Um, so hopefully, does that kind of make some sense? I get some reacts or questions. I'll pause a little bit because this is heady. Like this is this is a lot of stuff. This is like a whole chapter in economics that we just we just blew through and gave some fast examples to. You don't have to understand all of it yet, but like does that kind of make you know some conceptual sense, or do we have some questions? Oh, I see a chat. Okay. That makes sense. It makes sense. Love that. Okay. So this is a big thing to learn. You all are now going to ace an economics course after this crash course. Um, but beautiful. Okay. So now another big economics thing. And don't worry about, you know, there's no quiz at the end. This is just to help you conceptualize a lot of this. So externalities, maybe we've heard of them. Um, so according to the Ankle Dictionary, at least, it's a side effect or consequence of an industrial or commercial activity that affects other parties without it being reflected in the cost of goods. Um, so this can either be positive or negative. Often when we talk about externalities, we're talking about negative externalities, but it's important to know that there are also positive externalities. Um, so some of the negative externalities, when this idea was first ever created, it was created in the 1920s, by a French economist by last name Go. Again, that doesn't matter. Only econ nerds know that. That's okay. Um, I, as an econ nerd, as previously established, do you know that? Um, so the negative externalities are things like pollution from cars, right? When you're driving a car, you aren't paying for the pollution that comes out of your car. That just is going into society. Um, sound from freeways. Um, secondhand smoke. These are things that are not paid for by the person consuming or the person selling that good. Um, positive externalities though, also good, also know to know exist, also good to know exist. It's like education. A more educated society is at least thought to be a better society. Um, so that is a good, even though you want the one you know, getting all the degrees, society as a whole is benefiting. Um, public murals, when someone is paid to get, to paint a public mural, they aren't paid the same amount as all of the enjoyment that is out that gets produced by this mural, by this building being prettier. Um, planting trees. When you plant a tree, it might even cost money, but no one is out here paying you all of the money that that's going to benefit society. So that's what externalities are. Externalities are just when something good or bad happens because of an action that's not reflected in the cost. Right? That economics isn't directly dealing with. So we have the theory about this. So in the context of water, some of the externalities, the biggest one, of course, water pollution, big externality, people in companies polluting the water don't have any care about what happens. Um, also, you know, CO2 emissions and other um, air pollution that happens with things such as um, you know, energy production, that is a big externality. Um, 
fracking produces a lot of water externalities by polluting that water and contaminating the water, the fracking companies aren't paying for it. Um, so that's the policy F, right? And so this, you're already starting to see how these water externalities are starting to play into the topic. Um, agriculture runoff, like that's one of the novice cases this year. It's going to be a big case that the farmers don't pay for anything for the runoff. They just leave it, they let it happen. And then society is left to clean up the, those costs and to have those dead zones in the Gulf and polluted groundwater, right? But no one is directly paying for that. It's just, it's just happening. No one is dealing with that because it's an externality. It is outside or external to the action. Um, another externality is the depletion of groundwater that, you know, maybe a farmer has a well and they're, you know, irrigating their crops and that's happening and then they're selling the crops and all of that. But what's not taken into consideration is that depleting resource of groundwater. They are not paying for it. No one is paying for it. And so it becomes an externality. It becomes a cost of society. Um, so what happens when we have externalities, that's the fancy graph, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. Um, I think this just had a pointer. Does it have a pointer? It does. Okay, love this for me. I think you all can see my mouse. Beautiful. Okay, so this is a basic graph of externalities. Um, stole this one from Wikipedia because it was really simple. Um, so what happens, you know, we have, um, this is the, so we have, this is demand. When price goes up, it goes down. Okay, this is, we have two supplies. So the first is the, um, oh, this is production. Oh, this is backwards. Okay, well, the first here still is the point though. So the first is actually um, the market. So these labels are switched, it's fine. Um, and so first we have a line that is, produces a higher quantity for each given price, right? So for each quantity, the price is lower than it actually is. This is the externality. Um, and then there's the total cost here. And this total cost is higher. Basically, all you need to know is that the total cost is therefore higher, which means if it was priced higher, like it should be to calculate that cost, there would be a lower quantity and higher price paid. So all you need to know about externalities realistically is that someone else is paying that extra cost and that extra cost goes to society. And what that means is there is a higher quantity than there would be if it had been priced correctly or if everyone in the um, society, you know, thoughts and cost were calculated, then there would be a higher price and lower quantity. Um, so that's also called internalizing externalities. They're no longer external, they're now internal. Um, and so when we look back at the water externalities, if companies had to pay for their water pollution, then the cost would be higher and the quantity of them polluting would be lower. So that's what's important to know about externalities is it causes the social cost. And when there's a social cost that no one's paying for, the actual cost paid is so much less than the cost to society. It's like getting a big coupon because you're an industrial person, right? You're an industrial company, you get this big coupon, you know, you know, 20% off your actual cost sort of coupon. And that's what happens when there are externalities. So one of the things, you know, things like carbon taxes or taxes often are trying to internalize those externalities. So we get back to the socially optimal, what society wants level of things. Because society is willing to pay some price for things such as you know, energy or driving cars. Um, but so it's not that the socially optimal amount is zero. It's just that the socially optimal amount is less than what is going to happen. Because when people have coupons, they buy more. Um, and so it's basically how we can think of externalities. Now we're moving from externalities. Okay, and here's another big, another big term. I suppose this is the last massive term of economics we're gonna hear, um, which is the idea of a natural monopoly. Now we've heard of 
like Monopoly. Monopoly is while they were playing the game, right? The goal is to own as much as possible and then be able to hike up the price. Um, or, you know, thinking about Amazon and their monopoly over e-commerce that's happening, right? They're able to get all the market share and then jack up the price, right? That's the goal. Um, or, you know, Apple um, or Google, right? Like they're trying to gain as much market power as possible. Um, now there is one type of monopoly that economists think is kind of a good monopoly, um, if you will. And so that good monopoly is called a natural monopoly. And why it's called a natural monopoly is not that it's you know, particularly natural, but rather that it happens with natural resources. So this natural monopoly happens with things such as electricity, water, um, sewage, basically any of um, your utilities will be natural monopolies. Now, what this graph is saying, I know there's a lot going on in this graph too, um, is that the cost of production for each item starts really, really, really high and then comes down over time. That's the entire, entire point of this graph. That's the one thing you get is the cost starts really high and goes and then really gets really low, right? So for your city to build all the pipes to bring water to your house cost a lot of money. That first gallon of water for you know the city of Baltimore cost at, at that point, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars, and today, you know, probably millions and millions of dollars, right, to lay all of those pipes for the infrastructure. But then that, you know, a millionth and one gallon that they're bringing to your house doesn't cost very much, right? So the question becomes, one, who can do this? Like, who has the effort to build this infrastructure? You're not going to see a return for decades. Um, and the second question is, how do you price that then, right? Do you price it as the average cost here of, you know, cost one? Or do you price it as the average cost of two? And that's what all these boxes are saying, is that the average cost here becomes so different. Um, and the total cost is different than even the average cost, which comes different than the marginal cost and all those things. So, you know, total cost being everything, um, average cost, of course, being, you know, averaging it out. Um, and then marginal cost, economists like to use, you know, margins and marginal costs. And that just means the additional cost. Um, so anything on the margin is just anything additional. And so the question is that additional cost of gallon two of water also really high because you had to lay a bunch of pipes. But that example of the millionth and one gallon of water, that cost was really low. It wasn't a whole lot of cost there. It was really just, you know, continuing the operation and continuing to drill it out of the ground, out of the, you know, aquifer. And that was, that's it. Um, out of the river, out of the lake, like that's, that's all there was to it, right? The concern here is that the average cost is so high because of things like pipes of that um, and just the whole infrastructure is so expensive and that's the reason that most of the time we buy our water from the city right it's why you know it's a city of Chicago that's it. it's the city of LA like um, a lot of our utilities are through the city um, because of this reason that it's such it's so expensive up front that no private company would ever do that because they could do so much more of that capital um, in such a shorter amount of time. So that's the reason that often the water infrastructure has to be built by a government. Um, let's lead us to that specific aging infrastructure. Um, why is the infrastructure aging so badly in the United States? What, what is the problem? And the problem is that there's no incentive to fund it, right? If even think of Flint, Michigan, the city of Flint doesn't have, a, they have as much, you know, incentive to fund it as anyone else, but because um, they should be good people, but their like economic incentive, if it were a company, wouldn't exist uh, because they wouldn't make more money if they would have fixed the pipes. Um, it's just a lot of upfront investment. So no one wants to fund it, right? It's so expensive at front, but there's no economic return for a while. Um, and so that's why it's so hard to fund infrastructure is because of the way this graph looks is this funding over here on by the cost axis is so high, which is why we get this problem. Um, in the 70s and 80s, it was largely um, funded by the federal government. 
And that's the reason we are starting to see this aging infrastructure specifically is the shift from local and to, to local and state governments from the federal government funding infrastructures, particularly in water infrastructure. Um, and so that's causing funding problems and that's causing um, just a lot of you know, aging infrastructure because the federal government has more access to capital because they can print money where state and local governments don't. And again, I know I'm looking at the graph a lot, um, whenever you have a federal government, you're able to you know, really invest this upfront um, and have that long-term payoff. But when you're you know, a local government, you can't do that. And because of the shape of the infrastructure graph and the natural monopolies, you have these massive funding problems that keep existing because of huge upfront cost um, before you reap any benefit. Um, and so when it shifted to state and local governments, they decided that the infrastructure is good enough. It's working fine. It's, we, we don't need to fix it um, because it's so expensive. And so that's the reason that we see a lot of this aging infrastructure right now, right? And understanding the natural monopoly helps us understand why that is, right? Obviously governments should you know, take care of their people and not poison people, probably important, very important, um, very important function of the government. But that's the reason that's happening um, because there's no economic incentive to do it. Um, some of these problems, right? We get things like leaks because of aging infrastructure. We have the lead pipes, the contamination, access problems. Uh, we see a lot of that with the um, access with tribal lands, for example, right? That like when that has shifted to other governments that has caused problems across all infrastructure and property rights issues. Um, and it's caused a lot more contamination. Um, and so these are the problems that we see from the aging infrastructure, but all of this can be explained and probably the economists in the seventies and eighties who said that when the federal government takes you know, a step back from funding this, this is going to happen. And now we're seeing it in 2021 that this is absolutely what happens um, when we stop funding infrastructure. But that's the reason that infrastructure has not been funded as well. And of course, like politics and people don't want to spend money and all of that. But that's the economic theory, at least behind it. Right. How would I go industries? So this is at least 2010. It's the best graph I could find. Um, I didn't want to make my own graph. Um, so this is who uses the most fresh water. I'm sure that um, if anyone lives in California, you've definitely heard this, but a lot of people, especially in urban areas, have heard a lot about how do we save water, right? Like we take shorter showers, we try not to water our lawns. I don't know why people water their lawns. That seems odd to me, but okay. Um, you know, we need to conserve water, you know, turn off the sink when you're, when you're brushing your teeth. Um, we've heard all of that, right? Um, but the reality in the United States is that people, use very, very little water in the country, right? So people use self-supplied, so domestic, right? So they use like 1%, no, sorry, 12%. Self-supplied domestic is like people, um, like with wells and things like that, but they use 12% public supply. That's all is applied to like, like through the city. Um, so whether that's watering your lawn or that is, um, you know, washing your car, taking a shower, drinking it, washing dishes, all of that, all of the human, your direct action has public supply. It's only 12% of the fresh water withdrawals. That's it. Um, you know, 13 if you include people like with wells um, in the country. Um, but 45% of that is thermoelectric power. Let's define what that means. Um, thermoelectric power is where basically anything, the thermo means to heat up um, electric power. So that is any sort of nuclear energy that is um, like fracking because they have to burn the fuels. That is, you know, um, oil being used as electricity. That is natural gas used as electricity. That is um coal being used as electricity any fossil fuel you can burn used as electricity is thermoelectric um and any like nuclear power same thing it heats up the water creates you know fire and then that creates um 
electricity. Um, and so that's how that, that's what that means, right? Is thermoelectric power. And so that uses 45% of fresh water in the United States. Um, and then irrigation, so watering crops specifically, not just, you know, grass and people's lawns, that's, that's 12%. Um, the irrigation of crops in the United States is 32%. Um, so that's, you know, a lot of farming, um, agriculture, and then we already talked about 12%, self-supplied industrial, um, means that they're you know drawing from wells and sources of water. Um, aquaculture, 3%, mining is 2%, and then self-supplied domestic. Um, so yeah. Um, so basically, all of this to say is most of the water in the United States is not used by everyday citizens. It is mostly used by electricity production, um, industry, and um, agriculture. Those are the biggest users of fresh water in the United States. Really important, I think, to put that into context. So that way, when we're talking about things you know, like the fracking app, that we understand just how much water they use and why electricity consumption and agriculture and food consumption is such an important part of this topic because of the percentage of water that they use in the United States also globally, but the topic is the United States. So, you know, it's, it's the United States here. Okay. Now we've talked about that. Moving on to another concept. There's a lot of concepts, a lot of rapid fire here. Um, but this is just supposed to be, you know, an overview. Um, if you have more questions about economics and how a lot of this functions, have an answer them. But we're now diving into property rights. So there are two major property rights discussions, uh, which again, economics claims property rights is one of their things. Uh, it's really not, I think it's more of a legal thing, but economics claims it. Um, and back when we were looking at, you know, private goods versus um, public goods, property rights really matters for that, right? And so that's the reason we need to talk about it is how do we treat it economically, depending on who owns it, right? So the question becomes, who owns water? And that is a really tricky question. Um, so there are kind of two contexts here. First, I'm going to start more locally and then go more broadly. Um, so more locally, because um, I assume most of you all didn't grow up in the country like I did, where everyone's just drilling a well and you hear regularly at church on Sundays about people's well issues and all of that. Um, I don't know why I know my uncle has three wells, but he does. Um, but so what happens in, so in the ground, basically you have, you know, kind of basic soil and then sandstone, um, like softer, um, you know, a softer stone, if you will, um, and then water and then like hard rock. Um, at the bottom. So there's this aquifer. You'll probably hear aquifers a lot on this topic. So that just means kind of a pocket of water um, that is under the soil and under some rock. Um, if you've ever dug into like, you know, building a fence or, again, this sounds really country, but we, we had a lot of like shovels digging situations um, going up. I don't know if you all did, but um, right, so you hit rock first, right? That's the sandstone once you get past the soil. Um, and then if you dig deep enough, um, you get to an aquifer. Um, when I, and it depends on where you are in sea level, where that aquifer is. So if you're in the mountains, it's basically impossible to like, you know, really hard to drill a well. Um, but if you're in a lower altitude, it's really easy to hit groundwater. Um, and after it rains, that aquifer swells up and gets higher. And when it's a drought, it gets lower. Um, when we, when I was a little kid, I lived in New Orleans and I had a black lab who was a puppy at the time and New Orleans is like in a bowl. So it is very, um, low groundwater. It's very, very low sea level. Um, and the little black lab had the time of her life after it rained and she could dig far enough to hit the aquifer. Um, and she would just like play in that water because she realized she could dig like, you know, like a foot and just get this massive pool of water. Of course she like destroyed the yard while doing it. Um, but that's how in some places it's really, really easy to get to the aquifer as my black lab found out. Um, in some places it's much, much harder. And it depends on what that like sandstone is like. Um, but what happens here 
um, is you have the aquifer, right? Which is fine when there's a lot of rain, a lot of water, like not a lot of people are using it, like totally cool. But what happens is it's like kind of a huge pool and these wells are like straws. So when you have a bunch of people, you know, sucking on the straws, then the aquifer goes down further and further. And when it continues to go down, you have to dig deeper and deeper wells. Um, and so what happens with these aquifers and these groundwaters is that it kind of becomes, you know, race to the bottom, literally, of you have to drill deeper and deeper to get to these wells, um, which is how a lot of this exclusion is happening. And it's also the reason, for example, fun fact, that Mexico City is sinking right now is because this aquifer, which held up the stone, is now sinking and getting lower and lower and lower. And the problem is you own this plot of land, but you know your soil stops there, that's fine. But you can't put up walls in an aquifer. You can put a fence up, up on top, but when there's an aquifer, you can't exclude everyone that lives in that same exact aquifer. When you take a bunch of it, it depletes it for the rest of the people. Now where this comes in really important is think of um, California and the agriculture. So what's happening is a lot of the industrial agriculture is um, drilling really, really deep wells and pooling out this water. So what happens is it's draining the groundwater for cities. It's draining the groundwater for other people. Um, and that's what's causing a lot of this water shortages, shortage problems is because this aquifer under the ground, you can't exclude because it goes everywhere. So while, um, especially in America, you know, you own the rights above your land at a certain point, you own, you know, your land and the fence and you always own a certain point, you know, below it, no one really owns that aquifer. You own what is beneath you, but the problem is that affects everyone. You know, it's, it's like a pool and like a shallow pool and everyone having big straws. If someone starts pumping out water with a pump out of a pool, you over here on the deep end, you know, on the shallow end, um, or deep end of when you want to be in this swimming pool, um, you get affected, right? That your water is also going down. So that's the question of property rights is no one knows. It's, there's no good answer to that because of the way that aquifers work, the way that they exist. Um, which apparently I knew a lot about growing up with wells, but that's the kind of basic comment. Um, it's like it's a basic, you know, way that that works. Um, and then moving more, you know, globally, more, you know, you know, bigger context is we're looking at the Colorado River Basin, which is a really important basin um, that will be a huge part of the debate topic. Um, so it affects six states here and Mexico. And so what happens is you have this groundwater thing I just described, plus the Colorado River flowing through, and all of the things I just described are happening with these states, right? The more water Arizona uses, the less New Mexico has. And states like New Mexico and California and Nevada who only have a little bit of this are really concerned because when this starts shrinking, they don't have access at all and they need this groundwater. So what's happening, you know, California here and Nevada, especially Las Vegas, really deeply concerned is Las Vegas here. Um, it's holding on, but um, Las Vegas is also sucking it out with a massive straw right now. And they're pumping out the water in order to simply survive. And that's affecting everyone here in this river basin, right? So the question becomes, whose water is it? And so, you know, Wyoming, so, you know, it's starts here. Like, this is, this is our water. We're going to use our water because, again, like we talked about with the farmer, it's under their land. It's under their state. It's part of their state. But the problem is, how does that affect everyone else? Because, yes, it's under your state. But when you start pumping out water, that affects the water level for everyone. Right. So that becomes a really, really big property rights question, both locally in the case of, you know, agriculture and within specific states and with specific communities, but it becomes a massive problem and even an international concern because Mexico is part of that same water basin, as well as, you know, the, all six of those states fighting over the same water. And the question is who owns it? Um, and there, there's no real question, right? Is it like part of your percentage of, you know, what you have of the basin, but then how is it affected? Because if you use 50%, then like, how are we measuring that now, you know? Um, and so that becomes a real problem. And that's also it's the major problem is 
especially given a lot of droughts and global warming and just the river is drying out now because there's less rain because a hotter climate means more evaporation of water and all of those things. So the question becomes really deeply who owns it, but it becomes a much, much deeper question than that. Um, and that's kind of the context here. That's why I went so deep into the farming example because then, then the whole Colorado River Basin makes sense um, and the problems that a lot of the Southwestern states are facing right now. So now we're going to talk about the solutions. We're getting to the happy part. Um, actually, I'm going to be a naysayer on every single one of these. So don't be don't be too excited about me giving solutions here. Um, so yeah, few solutions. So first, talking about some of the public solution, um, private solution, and then some other solutions. And then we'll talk about the context of debate. Yeah, the public slash regulation, right? So some of the ways to deal with this water crisis if we're treating it like a public good, right? So non-rival, non-exclusionary, my access doesn't affect your access, um, but I can't exclude you, which means the public sector should deal with it. It should be a matter of the government, right? So obviously more public investment, obviously important. Uh, maybe like a cap and trade system, right? If everyone can use it, um, how, do we, how do we handle that out? Um, especially for industry and agriculture, because as we saw earlier, the more scarce water is, the more problems we have. Um, so maybe it's part of the public sector's job and regulation job to make sure it doesn't get scarce. And so maybe there's a way to do that um, with regulation, right? Improving technology and infrastructure, right? If it's not leaking out of the pipes, then it's going to be, there's gonna be more of it, right? If we improve technology, if we improve irrigation technology and crop technology, then we don't need as much water. Um, if we improve, you know, even fracking technology, we don't need as much water to blast into the ground. We don't need as much water to cool down, um, you know, thermoelectric energy production if it doesn't get as hot or if it's better controlled or whatever. Um, I'm not an engineer. I don't know those things. Um, but the better, the safer, you know, say nuclear energy gets, the less water it needs, right? So a lot of technology, especially in the thermoelectric, sorry, is over 40% of water usage in the United States, um, then that can really make a massive impact. And some of the best way to improve technology and technology adaption is through the public sector, right? Think of public universities, think of, you know, things like the EPA, and um, you know, big grants and the Department of Energy and all of those you know, government agencies can potentially help with that technology and infrastructure and even other sectors, right? We think of water infrastructure as simply being the pipes, right? We think of the pipes in Flint, but water infrastructure also means the technology that we use. Um, and other parts of the water infrastructure, whether it's a big well, wells or the way that we are using um, you know, irrigation and things like that is also part of the infrastructure that makes up water protection. Um, and some of the problems is, problems are, oh, um, <laughs> swear I don't speak English, um, is that you have you know, state versus federal, who does this, right? That you have um, the you know, state governments all fighting over this regulation. So with the Colorado River Basin, who is the regulator body? It's when you see a lot of, I think, affirmatives having interstate compacts between those six states to deal with it because there's no way to do regulation, you know, state by state if it's affected by everyone. It doesn't need to be state government. It doesn't need to be federal government. What's happening in California, a lot of, especially Northern California, could probably be dealt with by the state of California, but couldn't be dealt with by the city of San Francisco because a lot of that water usage is being used in, um, agriculture and a lot of it is outside the city, right? So you need a bigger body, you need the state. But then for the Colorado River Basin, the state of California can't really do much, right? For that regulation. So figuring out what level should it be given what kind of good is water, right? Is it a private good? Is it a public good? What kind of public good? Like who should be in charge of it? Who was affected, right? And these questions really impact what policies we choose, what public sector can do to impact our water protection. Okay, so just how, how do we decide these things, right? Like, as I talked about with even California, the answer is just not California should do, um, you know, water protection. It becomes so much deeper and I think more complicated than that, um, even as far as, you know, public sector solutions. Let me get that private solution, uh, which is of pricing. 
Um, so there will definitely be um, a pricing counter plan. I'm sure that's going to um, exist in this year's topic. Um, so the question, of course, becomes scarcity. Um, how do we value water? And that probably depends on how scarce it is, right? The price of water, if we were to price water, would be different in California than it is in Michigan, right? It's very different even in the city of Chicago, which has all of Lake Michigan, basically, that they think is their entire pond. It's, it's not, does not belong to the city of Chicago, but they really think it does. Um, as a resident of Chicago, I can say that. They definitely think that they own the whole lake. Um, versus in Arizona, right? Like Tempe, Arizona, would have a very different price of water than Chicago um, or even Phoenix, like very, very different prices of water, right? So how do we price that? Who values it? Like agriculture values it in one way different than, you know, I do to wash dishes, but you know, the water that I drink, I value differently. So how, how do you value water in that way? Um, so people pay so much more for bottled water than they ever would to pay to take a shower. Um, and then the question is, how do we, price? we're not just pricing the water, we're pricing the delivery of water too, that expensive infrastructure I talked about. Yeah, how do we value that? Like, how do we price that out? How do we include that price? And if we're pricing it, people probably want, you know, better pipes than they have now. Like, how does that work? Um, I know that there is, you know, pricing of water in the context of like paying you a water bill, right? But this idea of pricing of water is a lot um, more well, dynamic, that it moves a lot more and involves also pricing the water that people get out of groundwater and aquifers, right? So it's not just pricing as the consumer, but also pricing um, when the uh, city of LA is getting their water, right? They're not really paying for it um, or, you know, farmers in Missouri um, drilling wells, they're not really paying for it except for the delivery system of the like well itself, right? So how do you price that commodity? Um, because it is more scarce, right? Like we, um, you know, clean air, we don't pay, we don't have to pay for it, but a lot of that isn't as, um, that's not like scarce, right? But water is becoming scarce. Um, and so how do we pay for that and actually value the scarcity of water beyond just the delivery system? Because right now, most of what we're paying for, even as consumers, when we're paying a water bill, is that delivery system. Um, and then kind of lastly here is thinking about how do we price water, if we were to price water, um, is the externalities. How do we you know, bake in those costs, right? That when I take a bunch of water to irrigate my field of corn, how am I affecting the scarcity and value of water elsewhere? How do we factor in water pollution? If you're polluting water, um, how do we make you pay for that in the water system, right? Um, and so that becomes a lot of these questions of how would we price water? Now, what are the problems of this? So we shouldn't I pay exorbitant amounts of money to simply drink water, to have water, to do things like shower dishes and drink water to survive. The question is it becomes a basic human right and we shouldn't keep people from having water to survive because they don't have a lot of money. Like that is a massive problem that water is a basic fundamental human right, right? So some economists are like, let's have subsidies for the first however much water we think you need. Um, of course, that becomes a massive pricing structural problem, right? It's like, you filling out forms of like basically rations of water, which is, I mean, maybe is what we could, would get to, but then this also isn't a fully private system, right? Is that this is the reason just let's price water for agriculture doesn't work is because of the water being watered, a basic human right, right? It's not, um, you know, jet planes or whatever, like it's a basic human right, right? We can't just price people out of water. Like that's, that's not okay um, to do. Um, and so all of these, you know, concerns really come down to, you know, what can the free market, what can capitalism do for, for the water? Um, also, this is a yikes speaking of um, water pricing. If anyone is interested, there is now um, the like stock market and the markets are now selling futures of water, um, which is on the future price of water because they're realizing water is really scarce. So Wall Street Bros, instead of like doing something about the water prices or like really caring about it or now just betting on it instead, like they um, bet on oil futures, which is how like oil become negative at one point. So people betting on the price of oil. So think of GameStop, but like with a basic human necessity um, instead of GameStop. 
So yeah, that's happening right now. That's just a really bleak note that is really also deeply fascinating if anyone's interested in. Um, but yeah, that's just a yikes on why maybe we shouldn't just let the free market run wild with our water is because they do things like selling futures of water. It's wild. God. Um, but yeah, other solutions um, is desalination, I'm gonna talk about that briefly, um, which is that whenever you take seawater and basically pull out the salt of it and you have salt left and then um, you know fresh water, the problem is that creates super, super, super salty water, um, but then you throw it back into the ocean and you mess up the entire like pH and ocean ecosystem. And it's also really expensive and no one but Israel does that. Um, so that's not that much of an option. It's really tricky, uh, definitely difficult. Um, so you will probably hear that at some point, like we have so much water in the ocean. Why can't we just use that? Um, but desalination, definitely read more about it. Um, I'm not a science guru, so I'm not going to, you know, tell you all about desalination, but that's kind of the basis of it and why there's some problems. Um, how do we improve water quality? Um, so, you know, maybe if we can just treat more water, you know, like whether it's flack, fracking fluid or industrial water or agriculture runoff, then we could just we use that water, right? If it's always clean water and we use a lot of water treatment, then that's fine. Um, it's the whole thing of like, oh my gosh, you're drinking water, um, dinosaur pee, you know, like that's what water is kind of thing. Um, but it's how do we recycle that water is one, one real solution. Um, and how do we improve um, water harvesting? Or like, how do we get more water and usable form like for humans. Um, so whether that is, you know, catching rainwater instead of it just running off or, you know, it goes into like lawns right now maybe, which isn't really a productive use of water. Like how do we more productively capture that water that's just going into, you know, things we don't really need maybe. Um, one would say like plants and grass is like probably good. Um, but like how much water do like, you know, does grass need? Like what if it's flooded, things like that, right? So, water harvesting is an important part there. And then another important part is just education. Um, kind of like what we're doing now, right? People just being more aware of those problems and people um, you know, being more conservative with water and not just like people taking shorter showers, which we hear all the time about, you know, how to be green friendly, you know? Um, but, you know, people replacing their lawns with things that don't need to be watered. Um, people um, protesting large scale agriculture and things that use an absurd amount of water or even um, crops that shouldn't be grown in certain places but are like think of the almond fields in California that use so much water right and so that's a sort of like education component. Um, yes, question on desalination. Yes, so um, one thing, uh, so the question is, would it be possible to not dump the extracted salt back into the ocean and sell it? Um, it is, but the thing is you get so much salt and what's significantly cheaper for desalination is to create super, super concentrated saline. Um, and so it's like, doesn't have that many uses. They definitely do sell some of it back to the industry, but instead of just like table salt, what happens is they get super, super concentrated salt water. And there's not a lot they can do with that at that point. So that's one of the big um, problems with desalination. Um, and it's just like absurdly expensive. Um, but yeah, so those are some of the like major solutions as well, just like the more improvement, the more education we can have, the more we can actually conserve water, right? Because we talked about how like regulation is difficult, why pricing won't work, like all of these things, right? So it has to be some combination of that. Um, and understanding what will and won't work helps us craft better policies and to be able to negate better policies as well. So what does that, what does this mean for debate? Um, and so the debate, um, kind of four major things here. Um, first is the politics DA. Um, why is it important um, whenever we're talking about wa um, water protection, what sort of you know, lobbies, what sort of um, interest groups are really gonna care about water protection? Well, there are two main ones. Who, anyone wanna answer what, what lobbies and what like industry groups really want to fight more regulation on water? Nope. Okay, I can't get 
Um, so the, what, it's hard to get my screen. I don't know how this works. Um, and so the real answer to that is agriculture and um, like energy industries are really going to fight back any sort of action on water protection. So that's why it matters to know who uses the water and why they have an economic advantage because, well, that's the um, and then the energy prices, DA. obviously that's all based in economics, but understanding um, the fracking contaminating water and that externality that they're not paying for is really important to understand their um, water usage and to understand how um, prices of that will make prices of everything, especially those outputs when the inputs are higher and the outputs um, are then going to be charged more is also a very basic economic fact. Um, and then we talked about the pricing counter plan, of course. Um, and next is, of course, the capitalist critique, right? Like, what can the private sector solve? Well, what can't they? What are the problems with pricing water, right? What is, um, what are the limits of regulation? Um, what can the government do to actually solve these problems, right? It's probably treat it like a public good, but how does that actually function um, is a huge question. Thanks, too. The activity slash your homework, um, if you want to. Um, so thinking about the CAPK versus any policy F. Um, so pick one of the following cases. I have a little list here. Um, or your own. Those are just some cases that I thought would be easier for this. Um, and write out why a capitalist system can and can't solve this water crisis. Um, so Flint, right? So um, kind of walk some of these. Um, is that why it can't is because of um, that big natural monopoly, those huge startup costs, right? Um, and so the reasons that capitalism could is if you were able to properly price water to pay for those improvements, for example, right? Or that you're paying for those delivery systems and then that creates an incentive to have better water and healthier water. Um, and, you know, ban fracking, like that one should be, you know, a lot easier, you know, talking about the externalities and the contamination that that um, has to be solved by, um, some of that has to be solved by regulation, but capitalism might be able to solve it by internalizing those externalities. If energy companies had to actually price in the impact of the contaminating water and price in that, um, all of the problems that it's causing with groundwater, then maybe fracking would be a lot better. Maybe we would solve that problem simply by charging them what they should be. Um, so that's a way that the cap K can't solve. But then we have to think about how the cap K can solve, right? If we get rid of capitalism, like what would then happen? Um, and so you can give like a, you know, one and a half minute, I think like mini speech. So just that part of your speech when you're doing like a you know speech we do, but you're just doing one part of the speech um, to talk about how like the cap K, for example, can solve the affirmative, or if you want to take the affirmative stance, how the cap cake cannot solve the um, the case and the impacts, like what are the limits of that? Um, and then be sure to just give lots of explanation. So you should definitely be able to fill up a minute and a half if you give plenty of explanation on either side of that. Um, so yeah, that's the activity. Um, but yeah, any questions? I feel like that was, that was a lot. We really crash course through it, but hopefully we understand at least Maybe we just understand more about how aquifers work. I don't know. Um, but we definitely, you know, have at least, you know, kind of thought about some of the limits of both economics, but also the way that, you know, kind of our system works um, and how do we work with and ultimately, you know, create a better solution, whether that is, you know, some form of pricing or regulation, or if it's just, you know, the abolishment of the whole pricing system um, and the, you know, capitalism K alts, like, you know, kind of thinking about what that looks like. But yeah questions. Let's see. Perfect, perfect. I got that it was really straightforward. Love that. Um, or you're just overwhelmed. You're like, wow, Victoria just threw straight economic theory at me. Had some water examples, but basically we just learned about how aquifers worked. Um, but yeah, any other questions? I'm really excited. I got to, got to nerd out about things I enjoy doing, um, talking about economics. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day.
Thank you. Thank you.